Did you know retirement costs LGBTQ people about 40% more than the general population? And most retirement calculators don't factor that in? That's why we're excited to have Samantha Hernandez of the Money Institute on today's Queer Money episode 241. Samantha is an LGBTQ money coach and is very concerned about LGBTQ people's lack of retirement savings and the incomplete information we're getting on how to even prepare for retirement. Samantha is a queer millennial who racked up over $43,000 in debt within a year and a half after graduating college. She has now paid off over $10,000 and saved $21,000 in just the last 11 months and is using her experience and the personal finance and coaching education that she's acquired since to help other LGBTQ people. If you want to retire someday, this episode is for you. Before we start the show, we want to give a shout out to a few folks from the Queer Money Facebook group. TJ shared he had an unexpected $1,000 emergency car repair expense. He was able to use his Capital One credit card to pay off that expense, and then he paid off that balance on his credit card before it was due. Brilliant. Alan saved an entire paycheck and is paying all his bills from December with his side hustle money. That is awesome. Finally, Adriana and Rochelle, two of the founding members of the credit card payoff course, shared recently that they paid off over $22,000 of their credit card debt with the help of the credit card payoff course in less than two years. Uh, Amazing. We make the Queer Money Podcast for you, so please email your money questions to questions at debtfreeguys.com or post them in the Queer Money Facebook group. We may answer your question in an upcoming episode. There's personal finance for the masses. This is not personal finance for the masses. This is Queer Money. How does your bank support the LGBT community? Not at all? For Pride in June? Or 365 days a year? Capital One proudly supports the LGBT community throughout the year. Maybe it's time to support a bank that supports us. Go to debtfreeguys.com forward slash cafe for more info. Stressing about debt is so COVID-19 2020. No matter how or when you got stuck with your debt, make 2021 the year it disappears. Poof! Sleep better at night and live happier during the day. I'm a unicorn! Sign up for the credit card payoff plan between January 2nd and January 4th this 2021 and get a one-time special offer, a free 45-minute 211. Out of the gutter, fellas. Money success session with us, the Debt Free Guys, a $197 value. cha Now, on with the show. <laughs> Welcome, Samantha Hernandez, to the show. We're excited to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to have another queer money nerd on the show <laughs> with us because <laughs> there are so many people out there in the queer community who don't like to talk about money. Probably mm-hmm. we all know many of the reasons, right? Because they're, they're <laughs> yeah. embarrassed or they're gun shy, right? They don't want to talk about right. their situation because somebody's going to judge them for it or they're going to mm-hmm. judge themselves. But we're glad that there's other queer people in the community talking about money now. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's awesome. I It's <laughs> one of my passions. Wonderful. Thanks. And how did you, you didn't take the normal path to get in this. How exactly did you become a money pro? Yeah, so I graduated from college, went into insurance and just have always loved talking about money and was trying to find what I could do around that. And I loved money so much, but I didn't know how to manage it. And I didn't realize that until about two years ago when I found myself in like $40,000 of debt. Half of that was from credit cards, half was student loans. And so I decided to make an Instagram page just to document my own journey to debt freedom, to hold myself accountable and find that community that really lives on Instagram and is really amazing. But as I was doing this, I started it back in January of this year. I found so many people reaching out to me, asking for help, asking for advice, um, just wanting to hear more about my story. And so that really inspired me to really take the time and put invest in myself and hire a coach and learn how to become one so that I could help more people. And then I was just kind of a general money coach for most of the year. And then in September, I really niched down and decided to work mostly with the queer community and educating them because we are at such a disadvantage. I love that story. And what I, th- what I love about it is that even though we're going through a pandemic and uh, we're the, the consequences of the economy, you still decided to sort of double down and, and go into business for yourself. It's, uh, how empowering is that? 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I quit my job in my corporate job in October to run this full time. And I mean, it did take a lot of sacrifices. I decided to move back in with my parents as, you know, the typical millennial, but I have enough saved to get by. That's awesome. wonderful. Yeah, we're always encouraging people to figure out ways to diversify their income streams um, and even consider becoming their own boss because it provides you a lot of autonomy. Now, there is a lot of stress, a lot of preparation mm-hmm. that's required of that and a lot of sacrifices to your point, but it does provide you a lot of empowerment. And so we yes. want to try to empower our community to do more of that. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So you had reached out to us because you have a concern. <laughs> <laughs> you have a concern about retirement in the LGBTQ community. And, uh, you know, this your message really resonated with us because we've been talking about this for years now. And it was just wonderful to hear that somebody else from a different background and perspective and from a different part of the community, a uh, different part of the country also ha- shares that this concern. So you wanted to come and talk about retirement and, and the challenges that the LGBTQ community has with retirement. And you had presented a stat that LGBTQ people, our retirement is typically 40% more expensive than the general population. Why Mm -hmm. do you think that is? Yeah. So, I mean, there's so much that goes into it, but the one major thing that I found is the cost of living. And I know that you've talked about this on another podcast as well, but it's really important to think about in terms of retirement because people who say are living in Wyoming that are queer may want to retire in a big city that is super, you know, LGBTQ plus accepting like New York or California. And so when you compare the average cost of living in those two places, it's on average 40% more expensive to live in an LGBTQ plus location. And so there's been a lot of studies about this and the top five LGBTQ plus places are about 142% and the average is 100%. So, you know, it's like 40% higher. Mm. Right. It's interesting. One of our most popular posts on our website is not personal finance related at all. It's gay cities. And we have have a, a list there of 25 affordable gay cities because just what you were saying, most queer folks, when they think about these cities of, I like to call them cities of refuge. I know that's a biblical mm-hmm. term, but it, I think for many people in the queer community, they did become cities of refuge because they have fled either environments in the home or environments in their community that prevented them from being their true selves. But you go to places like New York, LA, Chicago, Seattle, Miami, you just think about all of these, these are these massive cities that have higher costs of living and for so many queer folks, they want to go to those places, but they simply mm-hmm. can't afford it. And I think that's right. why so many people are attracted to that article that we have, is that we're all looking for an economical way to survive mm-hmm. and thrive, right? And that's mm-hmm. why it's this idea or this suggestion that 40% more expensive for queer folks to retire in the cities where we would feel comfortable makes complete sense. Right. And so it's like you have to decide if this is something you are able to do for yourself or if you're kind of stuck in a place that's not accepting. And it's a really bad situation to be in for us. Yes. Yeah. You know, we just had an, uh, an older gentleman email us. His partner, his husband died a couple of years ago. He just reached retirement age himself and he wants to move down to Florida. And he said, mm-hmm. do you have any suggestions of where I can move in Florida? My only requirement is that it has to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you know, I kind of saw gay as being synonymous with expensive. (laughs) Right. Because typically, to your point, when we go to these places of of, of refuge, it's it's just more expensive. So what are the variables within the expensive city that are driving up our costs? It's not just just being in the city, but can you share what some of the variables are that, that are contributing to that? Yeah. I mean, there's so much. It's like when you you're in a big city that's super accepting. A lot of people want to be there for many reasons, not just queer people. Or there's a lot of people in the queer community who want to be there. So whatever is attracting people, say San Francisco, New York, you know, those are big tech hubs also. And so when you're getting more people, you know, the supply goes down, demand's going up. It's just the price has to raise in order to weed some people out. And unfortunately, that's, you know, kicking out a lot of the the queer community who can't afford it. Right. So it's really just economics 101, basically. (laughs) It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, one of the the parts about retirement that people don't think about 
is we use these retirement calculators online, right? And it asks you, what's your current salary? How much are you contributing to retirement? Okay, this is how much you're going to have. And we estimate you're going to need this much based on what your current living situation is. But if you're planning on moving somewhere that is going to be queer friendly and more expensive, then that's not a good base, you know? Mm -hmm, So you actually, like one of my suggestions is to go look into places that you would want to live ideally. You would rather save too much money than not enough. Mm-hmm. And really change the calculator. Like Nerd Wallet has a great retirement calculator. And on average, they estimate that you're going to need 70 to 90% of your current income to retire. But for people in the queer community looking to move, this could be like up to 140% of what your current income is. And so once you understand what your monthly costs could be, you can get a better estimate of how much you need to save. Yeah. It's interesting you bring this point up because. This whole idea of moving again, back on episode 237, which I think is the one that you referenced, where we talked about this kind of growing incomes for couples in the in the queer mm-hmm. community, and we talked about the idea that it's possibly that we're living in these larger cities. One mm-hmm. of the things that we found in the data was that the general population in these big cities is more likely to live in the suburbs, and the queer community is more likely to live in the urban core, which mm-hmm. we already know is the more expensive, most ex- typically most expensive areas within these cities. And we mm-hmm. do that because we like to be concentrated around other queer people or feel like there's a little bit more security there. So mm-hmm. when you're talking about moving to places like Florida or New York or California, it's not just moving to that city or state that is going to increase your costs, but it's also where you move in that city or state. Exactly. Those, the number of LGBT retirement facilities, facilities that are solely focused on serving the queer community is minuscule compared to the massive number of just general retirement facilities that there are out there. And you said supply and demand, Mm -hmm. the less that there's available, the more it's going to cost, the more that's Mm -hmm. available, the less it's going to cost. There's another tipping point for us why it's going to cost us more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never even thought about that aspect. That's crazy. Yeah, we wrote an article about gay retirement communities to move to. Mm -hmm. And we wrote that earlier this year, and we could Mm -hmm. only find 22 Wow. Um, to include in that list. When you think of all of the retirement communities that serve the general population, now it's, it's true, right, that we can, there are lots of non LGBTQ specific retirement villages and mm-hmm. centers and uh, nursing homes that we can go to and we will feel safe. But that's not the case across the board, right? We do have yeah, uh, lots of people going back into the closet, unfortunately, mm-hmm. when they have to go to these uh, nursing homes because they're not safe. And so w- mm-hmm. if we want to go to those sort of nursing homes that, that do accommodate, our uniqueness. You know, there are just few out there. And so it's it's, it's more expensive. Are there other variables other than location that are causing the increase in retirement? Because I think I've seen some studies that have shown that the healthcare cost for LGBTQ people is typically higher and especially so in retirement. Of course, that leads to medications and and whatnot. Are you finding Mm -hmm. other variables that are contributing to that other than just location? Yeah, I mean, yeah, healthcare is definitely an issue um, across the board. I think that another issue that you guys have talked about is our wage. And so a couple that, you know, two women are going to make less than two men in general. And then when you take into account, you know, people of color and all that, they're just making less in general. So the amount that they're able to save is going to be less than someone else. Right. Are you finding that there are different factors to consider in the calculation of retirement uh, for the L's, the G's, the B's, the T's, and the Q's? Are there different considerations in each of those variables or demographics? Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I would say yes. This would apply to everyone in the queer community because if you want to be around people in your community, then you would want to be in these bigger cities. But some people who fit the normal standards, you know, say someone might be bisexual and they end up in a heterosexual relationship in the end, you know, they can pass in society standards. So they might not feel as obligated to retire in a big city. They they could have the, you know, I don't want to say luxury because they're still, you know, shutting part of themselves all, but like they're not going to be, you know, judged um, necessarily by just their appearance. Right. Um, and that goes for anyone just in a, you know, standard fitting 
male looking, female looking, you know, relationship. Right. It was something we brought up on that episode 237 as well, this whole mm-hmm. idea of the binariness of the world we mm-hmm. live in today and the the patriarchal society when it comes to wages or acceptance. And all of that, I can't imagine, doesn't become exacerbated as we move towards retirement and need services, need support, are looking for places to go that... I'm not, you know, I definitely don't want to say that people should be code switching, but it does Mm -hmm. appear that folks who are able to code switch have some, to some degree, made more financial progress than those Mm -hmm. who are not able to code switch, which Mm -hmm. is something we have to take into consideration, right? I mean, we are who we are, and we are going to present as we are going to present. We Mm -hmm. have to understand what kind of impact that has on the rest of our lives, especially financial impact and in retirement. Well, to be yeah. clear, Clark Kent did support Superman's career. <laughs> <laughs> that code switching helped him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, code switching is like, it's crazy. I mean, I can get away with being, you know, a straight female because I'm femme presenting, right. even if I don't want to be, but I have the luxury to, you know, not be judged walking down the street. This podcast is sponsored by Capital One. Capital One is redesigning the banking experience by offering simple, straightforward, and seamless ways for you to bank from almost anywhere, so banking fits into your life, not the other way around. Stop stressing about your debt, sleep better at night, and live happier during the day. Sign up for the credit card payoff plan between January 2nd and January 4th, 2021, and get a one-time special offer, a 45-minute 211 money success session with us, the Debt Free Guys, a $197 value for free. Something else I had just thought of when we were talking about, you know, how this is affecting different people in the LGBTQ plus community. So in studies, it shows that trans people are actually less likely to hold a career. And this is, you know, due to many factors, but one of them being that they just don't feel safe Mm -hmm. and um, in a, you know, typical corporate workplace. And so a lot of times people are getting this advantage, which I got at my old company of we get a retirement match, but for being in a corporate job, you know, it's one of the perks that comes with it typically. Um, Not all the time, but this is putting them at a huge disadvantage if they're not even getting that option. So I think that that is something that is not really talked about. There's not much trans representation, but it's definitely something to take into consideration. So considering all these factors, what's your suggestion for how LGBTQ people should start planning for retirement and as well as maybe when to start planning for retirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would recommend start as early as possible. As soon as you get your first job, really start setting aside some money for retirement, whether that's in a 401k with your employer or a Roth IRA or just an IRA. But how you determine how much you should save is really what I want to focus on because that's the part that people are not looking into. And so they're ending up with a lot less money than they would actually need to retire in the place that they want to retire. So the hundred percent agree with that. And the, so the first step is to determine how much it's going to cost monthly for wherever you want to move, whether, you know, it's Los Angeles, New York, or, you know, Cheyenne, Wyoming, the costs are going to vary greatly. And so by doing your research, uh, you can just look up cost of living calculator and it will tell you how much more it'll cost to live in, you know, Los Angeles than in wherever you are, whether, you know, say Cheyenne. And so that will give you a good estimate of approximately how much more you'll need to save in order to afford to live there. So say, you know, it's 40% more expensive to live in Los Angeles, then you should increase what you need monthly by 40% of what you currently use. Do you have any suggestions? I'm, I'm thinking about, and no offense, but I'm thinking about but about individuals who are in your age bracket and younger, how uh-huh. they think about what amount of money I need for retirement compared to, I think somebody who is 50, 55, 60 years old, they're probably pretty comfortable and understand what their expenses will be like in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But somebody who's 20, 25, 30 years old, 
Do you have any suggestions of how they would plan ahead to what my life expenses might be like 30, 40 years from now? All that inflation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. I mean, you can do this same thing and just kind of estimate, but something else, if you know that's too much work or, you know, a lot of people just want to take the easy route, especially at this age. And so that usually means they don't start investing in retirement. So in order to avoid that, I would say start putting, you know, 10% into retirement. And, you know, between the 10 and 15% at our age is kind of the sweet spot. So if you can get up to 15%, that's awesome. But if you just start saving that amount, it might be, you know, a couple hundred dollars out of your paycheck, but it'll be, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in 60 years. Yeah. And at the very, at the very least, if you are working for a corporation, of, of course, contribute enough to your company sponsored retirement plan to get that corporate match because that's yes. you know, <laughs> not taking the advantage of that is leaving money on the table. Yeah, 100%. This is kind of a simplified way of explaining the time value of money. When you're young, you have to invest less money out of your paycheck to achieve the retirement that you want than you do when you're older. A mm-hmm. young person can save $50, $100 a month out of their paycheck when you're in your 20s. Whereas somebody who's trying to reach the same dollar amount who doesn't start until they're in their 50s is going to have to take thousands of dollars out Mm -hmm. of their paycheck every month. So Mm -hmm. if you, when you're young, you actually get to start sooner. You get to start that race at an advantage. Take advantage Mm -hmm. of the advantages that you can. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, That was like one of the best decisions I ever made. You know, that's why I thought I was good at finances because I understood retirement, but (laughs) that's not all to it. (laughs) But yeah, with retirement, I mean, in three years with my employee match, I got, I saved like $52,000 for retirement. And if I never add anything to it and, you know, it returns at about 8%, I'll end up with $650,000. And by the time I'm 65. Nice. That's awesome. So this is a great segue into my next question. An all too common email that we get from LGBTQ people, and and, uh, to be fair, it's mostly gay men, um, Mm -hmm. is they email us and say, you know, I want to retire next year and I have nothing or very little saved. What should I do? That's a scary question for us to get because the options Mm -hmm. are limited. So I'm Mm going to throw that at you so you can answer it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a very tough question. And I think that in that situation, maybe you would consider quitting your full-time job and taking on a part-time job or something that you're passionate about and start doing that now to kind of build it up and so that you can rely on it once you get to that point. Because just being 100% honest, you know, it's not going to be realistic for you to retire and not have to make any money if you are looking to retire next year and you have nothing saved. So the best bet is to, if you really don't want to work full time, try to figure out a way to make it work part time, but really also buckle down on your spending and make it, you know, your new lifestyle to live as a minimalist and try to save 90, you know, 50 to 90% of your income for the next couple of years so that maybe you can make up for it. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with that. The definition or uh, what retirement looks like has really evolved, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. And so the Mm -hmm. the concept that we're just going to, you know, sit on the front porch, drink lemonade and read books um, isn't necessarily (laughs) what people aspire to anymore, right? Um, And there are, uh, and what that has also included, a lot of people, when they retire, they go to work for nonprofits or to charities that they're Mm -hmm. passionate about. But there's also a way to sort of segue that into a part-time career or job in retirement, Mm -hmm. just like you alluded to. So just don't be so myopic as to what your definition of retirement is. Consider Mm -hmm. all the options and there may be a way for you to sort of piece some things together so you can have retirement and then over time that can evolve into morph into something different as you need it to. Right. And maybe you could save enough to put a down payment on a house and, you know, go that route of real estate that a lot of people love. There's so many options, but it really depends on your situation. Yeah. yeah. We, we wrote an article uh, earlier this year <laughs> as well uh, about financial planning for retirement. And uh, in mm-hmm. that, we have a lot of resources and tools for people to use. But basically, um, what we have found is that the prongs that everyone should include, especially those who are in a financial precarious position, to sort of expedite saving for retirement are to one, invest in the stock market, two, Mm -hmm. um, have your own full or part-time business, and three, do some sort of real estate investing. And there are very very many shades of what that can look like. And, Mm -hmm. And very often that combination or some combination of that can lead to the financial security that you're looking for. 
Right. I, yeah. I, I'll throw this out as a, as another suggestion for this idea of what what should I do if I'm closer to retirement than the money that I have available says that I am. <laughs> Make sure that you go to ssa.gov and sign up for your account, and I'm forgetting the name of the account right now, but it allows you to actually check to see what amount of Social Security money you are going to get based on the amount of money you've put in and the number of years that you've worked and the credits that you've accumulated. When you do that, it does one of two things for you. It may help you realize that your situation is not as dire as you think it is because you will be getting some money, mm -hmm. or it may make you realize that you have some additional work to do and you can't rely just on what you're going to be getting through Social Security. That I think that's a, a very important reminder for a lot of folks in our community a lot of us have relied on whether it's nonprofits or government or agencies, we've relied on them for services, and we just assume that those kinds of services will be available to us when we retire and everything will be taken care of. The money aspect may not be, you want to make sure you know what it is you're actually going to be getting from the government. That's actually the very cryptically titled My Social Security Account. <laughs> <laughs> so at, uh, you, you're a money coach and you work with folks and prepare them for all sorts of uh, life goals, uh, including mm -hmm. retirement. And I'm not necessarily sure of your, your demographics or the age of, of the people you coach, but how is encouraging them to start planning for retirement working out for you? Yeah. So I would say that my demographic is mostly millennials. I would say, you know, the 25 to 35 realm. So they are out of college or have been in their corporate job for a while and they are just struggling. They they hit rock bottom. And so that's really when I can come in and help them because it, unless they want the help, I, I can't you know, force it on them because a lot of it is just changing small habits. And so we work on their spending because a lot of times they have credit card debt or they have a lot of student loans. And so the only way to put more money towards it is, I mean, besides making more of income with the side gig, like we've talked about, mm -hmm. would be to cut back on spending. So we read recently in a CNBC article that about 15% of millennials, hold on, brace yourself, 15% of millennials expect to retire early. And since you're, what are your biggest demographics of the people that you work with are millennials? One, do you get that impression? Do you see that anecdotally? And two, is that viable for LGBTQ millennials or is that more for the general population? I love this question. <laughs> so it's so interesting to me because I've been reading a lot of statistics about specifically millennial queer people. And the queer community actually struggles with their spending. And about 50% report bad habits and 53% report that they struggle with saving. But then when they're asked if they have issues with money, they say no. So right. <laughs> it's definitely like very interesting to see that data. And so trying to find a way to speak to them that they understand that they actually have the issue has been interesting. But I definitely do think it's an option and it is super viable. I mean, so many millennials, like I said, are moving home, moving back in with their parents right now in the pandemic. And so they're able to save that money because they're still working. So they're saving rent from wherever they were. So all of that, you know, can be going towards an early retirement. But also, I feel like a lot of millennials who are saying they want to retire early aren't saying that they don't want to do anything. They want to start something that they're passionate about, be able to afford to, you know, start that company, um, work on some other projects that may be bringing in revenue also. So I think that it, it is definitely possible, especially if they start younger to really, you know, get on that fire lifestyle, the financially independent <laughs> retire early, which is awesome. But yeah, I think that it's also a great way for them to kind of take the time to segue into what they truly love and what they want to do, kind of like what I did, and um, build something out of that that they're still able to make money and have that income and not have to give up, you know, spending on things they love like Starbucks or travel Mm -hmm. um, and those types of things. Right. Yeah. And I'll follow up. Uh, I have another retirement question for you, but I want to tackle something that you mentioned uh, very early on in your response there. Why is it you think that millennials' feelings about their spending doesn't necessarily match the math? 
Yeah, this is a great question. You know, I think that no one wants to admit they have a problem um, <laughs> right. in any sort of situation. And I think money is such a sensitive topic to us all. I mean, like I told you, I didn't think I had a problem. I knew what retirement was, so I knew how to manage my money. But then I had $20,000 in credit card debt a year later. So mm -hmm. <laughs> clearly there, there was some misalignment. And so I think that you know, a lot of us don't grow up talking about money or grow up with, you know, these money stories or issues that are just played over and over again in our families. And so we don't see it as an issue. We're just like, yeah, I, I should be saving more, but it's not an issue. And so I think that's like kind of the rhetoric that we have in our head. And so just trying to break that is going to be huge with <laughs> this population. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring this up. John and I, when we first started our journey of talking to the queer community about personal finance and money related issues um, back in 2015, whether you were on Facebook or Instagram or the blogosphere, there were no other queer people doing this. And mm -hmm. I think that most recently, I mean, our, our list on our website of LGBT personal finance content creators now is at the point, I'm going to be updating this, but I think it's to the point now where, where we're up into the 40s. And if wow. you go on Instagram, there are probably at least 50, maybe more Instagram accounts that are run by queer people that are talking about personal finance. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's a, an explosion happening in this idea in our community talking about money. And I, and, and I will admit, a lot of it is, be, I think, being driven by millennials who watched what happened to their parents or watched mm -hmm. what happened to the economy and said, I'm not going to let that happen to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that conversation will seep into the everyday conversations that queer people are having? And, and, and I guess, let me just, uh, sorry, this is a long question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> the, the, the reason I ask this is I look at Latina women. I look mm -hmm. at African American women. I look at white men who are investing. I look at all of these different demographics of people, mommy bloggers, all of these different demographics. You can point to how they are having the money conversation, right? Mm -hmm. But when I go out to the queer community on Advocate Out, Queerty, all of these different websites, even in the in the social media space, I see very little of that kind of conversation happening between people who aren't already money experts. Do you think that's mm -hmm. going to happen? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's my hope. I think especially with this younger generation, Gen Z and, and the millennials now are really starting to take hold of topics that have been taboo in the past, you know, maybe body issues, eating disorders, like any sort of mental illness. It's all starting to come to light and people are becoming more and more open about it. And I think it's so amazing. And so... I think that this is a time where we finally have the opportunity to talk about money. And so it's being talked about a lot more in general, but it's specifically in the queer community. I think there's a lot of progress to be made, but I'm really hopeful that, you know, this will be more of a forefront issue. You know, I think that right now, well, a lot of people who seek specific, you know, queer communities are looking for that because they're in their coming out phase or, you know, they just need support in some sense. And, you know, we deal with a lot just being part of the queer community and having to, you know, navigate that journey itself, mm -hmm. that adding on top of it, you know, well, also we're not very good at managing our money uh, <laughs> is, is definitely tough. But, you know, I'm really hopeful that especially people who are past the phase of figuring out their their sexuality are able to really sit down and focus on finances. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's that's part of the reason why we have you on the show is we want other <laughs> queer people out there to know that there are other queer people talking about money. <laughs> exactly. I, I talk to everyone about money. I'm like, DM me anything about money. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So I, I'm curious about your perspective. This is my final question about retirement. From your experience, what do you suggest that all of us in the LGBTQ finance space can do to reach LGBTQ people sooner to talk about and encourage them to prepare for retirement? 
Yeah, this is a great question. I think that the lack of visibility is huge, like you've mentioned. Um, There's not enough articles written. There's not enough people talking about it. The message isn't getting out there. It's just kind of, you know, in small bubbles, which is great, but we somehow need to burst it. And so I think just the more that we can talk about it, um, I definitely have on my to-do list, like write an article um, and get it out there just so people can start seeing the visibility. Because I mean, this is a marketing thing, but it takes, you know, people at least seven times of seeing something in order to buy. And I feel like it's similar with, you know, wanting to make a change. You have to see something over and over again and be like, okay, this is really an issue. Let me look into it. Let me start talking about money. Let me get help with it. You know, so I just think that we just have to keep having these these types of conversations. Wonderful. I love it. So even before you write that article, how can our listeners connect and follow with you? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at The Money Institute. And I also have a website, themoneyinstitutecoaching.com. Um, so those are the two best ways. Awesome. And then are you working on any major projects for 2021 that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, I'm super, super excited. I'm going to be launching the first ever Broken Gay Mastermind. So Broken Gay kind of stemmed from, you know, wanting to tie in the two topics that I love and how uh, money affects being gay and how being gay affects our money. And so now I've created this mastermind to bring a community of people together of about 12 people. So hopefully this will start, you know, breaking that barrier of talking about money in the queer community. That's my goal. Nice. I love it. Congratulations. It's a wonderful idea. Thank you. I, we ask that question a lot and we don't get, we often don't get very unique answers. And so I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations. Um, so thank, thank you so much, Samantha, for reaching out to us and for coming on our show. We've, it's, this has been a great conversation and we're excited to learn what you're doing and how you're serving the LGBTQ community. And hopefully um, you'll help bring that age of Aquarius in like a parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Of course. Thank you. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Capital One's checking and savings accounts have no fees and no minimums. And with one of the best saving rates in America, you can rest easy watching your money grow with no fees to bring you down. You can open an account in about five minutes, which means you are only about five minutes away from getting your savings to grow with one of the nation's best rates. Thank you, Samantha, for joining us for an episode of Queer Money. And thank you, our listeners, for listening to another episode of Queer Money. Here is your Queer Money takeaway from this episode. Please take Samantha's advice and research the cost of living in the cities or towns in which you want to retire and accurately factor that cost of living in your savings for retirement plan. Samantha's rough estimate is to simply use about 40% of what most retirement calculators are providing you. It sounds like a lot, but it's better to have more retirement savings than less. We make the Queer Money podcast for you, so please email your money questions to questions at debtfreeguys.com or post them in the Queer Money Facebook group, and we may answer your question in an upcoming episode. Thank you, and have a great week.